Thanks for coming and supporting the UGA. A uh, special shout out to our speaker this month, uh, Landon Bergner. Just a little background on Landon. He's a graduate of the BYU Department of Geological Sciences where he got his bachelor's degree in 2010 and his master's degree in 2012. As a graduate student at BYU, he studied 20th century snow accumulation rates across the West Antarctic ice sheet. And since then, he uh, began PhD research at the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington, where he studied stable isotope geochemistry to study terrestrial climate systems during ancient greenhouse periods. He earned his PhD from the University of Washington in 2018 and began working at North Carolina State University as a postdoctoral fellow. Dr. Bergner's research interests include the related fields of paleoclimatology, soil science, geochemistry, and sedimentology. So we're super excited to hear about his research and background as it pertains to Utah and otherwise. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Landon to go ahead and dive right in. And just actually real quick, if anyone has questions, go ahead and ask them at the end or you're welcome to throw them up in the chat and I'll go ahead and read them off when we get to that point. All right. Awesome, thank you, Maria, for the introduction. It's uh, a lot of fun. I mean, I was really excited to be invited by you to speak today, and it's, uh, Marie didn't mention this, but we uh, did a lot of our undergrad and graduate studies at BYU together. So it's fun to see her and a lot of other names that I recognize and are familiar to me. So it's an honor to be here today and to be able to share a little bit of my research with you. So let me go ahead and pull up, let's see. Is that showing my presentation now, Maria? Yeah, you're good. Okay, perfect. I'll get going then. Um, so uh, like Maria hinted at, uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the research I've done over the past couple of years, uh, specifically in Utah, but also kind of in the greater uh, Western United States region specifically focused on the late Cretaceous. The title of my talk today is Reconstructing Lost Worlds, Dinosaurs, Environments, and Ancient Climate. And I'm gonna apologize up front. I realized after I sent the title to Maria, the, the it, it, it might seem like my talk is more focused on dinosaurs than it actually is. I promise I will mention them, but uh, it's actually gonna focus a lot more on climate. So hopefully that isn't too disappointing to people. And I would just, of course, like to acknowledge uh, all the people who've helped me with my research. Uh, as with any scientific uh, project or study, it's the result of, of many different, uh, many different minds and a, a lot of people with a lot of different skill sets and talents. And so, um, specifically, I have been uh, helped out by uh, collaborators and, and uh, graduate school advisors from the University of Washington. Uh, North Carolina State, uh, and then a whole host of other uh, institutions and, and universities as well. So this, uh, the results I'll present today are, are really kind of a group effort that I'll be sharing with you. I'm a geochemist and a paleoclimatologist by training, and as such, I like to spend my time thinking about how ancient environments transition uh, from, uh, from one climate extreme to another. I think one excellent example of that that's close to home for people in Utah is uh, the transit, the, the fossil butte in southwestern Mont uh, Wyoming, excuse me, and its transition from a lush, uh, lush um, subtropical uh, lacustrine environment in the early Cenozoic to a you know, very dry, cold environment today. And I'm interested in understanding uh, how how locations and sites on the Earth's surface can undergo such dramatic changes in evolution and climate. Um, to do so, I use a variety of tools, and today I'll mostly be talking about geochemical proxies that I use, specifically the isotopic composition of soil carbonates, and then also geostatistical and geospatial methods as well. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about the late Cretaceous greenhouse period, which is a, a, an amazing natural laboratory for understanding how climate and biological systems behave and interact uh, when atmospheric CO2 levels are high. And it really kind of serves as um, a testing ground for understanding how climate is going to behave in the future due to anthropogenic climate change. And for that region, reason, excuse me, has always been uh, very interesting. 
specifically, I'd like to talk today about the equitable climate fund, uh, which is an issue that's been noted for a long time uh, when uh, by, by researchers looking at greenhouse periods like the late Cretaceous. And it kind of boils down to this fact that we have uh, geological proxy evidence for low latitudinal temperature gradients, warm extra tropical mean annual temperatures and uh, evidence of reduced mean annual range in temperature, so reduced temperature seasonality, uh, even in continental interiors. And we have, so we have this whole host of proxy evidences for these, these warm equitable conditions, but our, our climate models, our, our uh, global climate models really struggle to reproduce these conditions unless you Oftentimes, you have to impose really unrealistic uh, boundary conditions to get them to, to, to agree with the proxies. So this, this fundamental disagreement between proxies and climate models has been termed the ex equi equitable climate problem. And for the last couple of years, I've been trying to pick away at this problem and, and understand or increase our understanding of why the proxies and the models seem to be disagreeing when we look at these warm periods of Earth's history. So for the rest of the talk today, I kind of like to divide it into two sections. First, we'll look at work I did in southern Utah and the western United States looking at seasonal temperatures in a greenhouse world, the late Cretaceous. And then for the last and kind of shorter part of the talk, I'd like to look at extreme Cretaceous climate gradients, specifically temperature, latitudinal temperature gradients, and their effect on plant and animal communities in the late Cretaceous. So that's kind of just a, a general outcome. So first off, we'll start, we'll, we'll begin by thinking about seasonal temperatures in a greenhouse world. And, and a lot of times in paleoclimate studies, we tend to talk about climate parameters like mean annual temperature or mean annual precipitation, but oftentimes it's the seasonal extremes of temperature and precipitation that are really driving uh, the distribution of, uh, of biological communities and, uh, and affecting the diversity and evolution of, of, of of environments. And so thinking about these seasonal temperatures is important. I already kind of introduced the equitable climate problem, but I think this uh, study uh, that, uh, that I'm kind of showing here by Hunter et al. in 2013 does a good job of kind of graphically summarizing uh, the mean annual range and temperature issue that we face when we're thinking about the equitable climate problem. Uh, Hunter et al. in 2013, they compiled proxy reconstructions of mean annual range and temperature, which I'm showing here in with these green dots, and they're distributed by latitude, and compared those to mo uh, model simulations of mean annual range and temperature, which I'm showing in these red squares. And you can see almost immediately that there's a, a large difference, especially at higher latitudes, between the model and proxy results. And you can also see uh, that the model simulations tend to be very consistent with modern estimates of mean annual range and temperature. So this dashed blue line here, hopefully you can see where I'm gesturing with my mouse. I didn't think about that, but this dashed blue line here shows modern mean annual range and temperature estimates or values from the ERA interim climate reanalysis data set. So we have this issue, this fundamental disconnect between the proxies and the and uh, people have kind of pointed fingers for a long time about whether the issue uh, or whether the problem lies with the models. Do we fundamentally not understand something about climate dynamics and we're getting it wrong in our climate models? Or is it an issue with the proxies? Are we not interpreting those climate proxies correctly? So when I started this study, my goal was to come in with a new proxy, an abiotic proxy of temperature, specifically the soil carbonates to try and reconstruct late Cretaceous mean annual range and temperature and see if using this new proxy we could provide new constraints on mean annual range and temperature and, and see if these new results agreed more with previous proxy reconstructions or with model simulations of uh, temperature seasonality. Now our study area then is Western North America specifically we're, we're looking at kind of the central part of Laramidia which was the western half divided by the Western Interior Seaway. Specifically, we were looking at, uh, we were collecting samples from two different formations that were uh, approximately coeval, the Kuiperowitz Formation in Southern Utah and the Two Medicine Formation in, in Northern, uh, Northwestern Montana. 
both of these formations uh, were uh, formed as sediments deposited uh, by uh, rivers that were flowing down from the Cordilleran Highlands during the late Cretaceous towards the Western Interior Seaway, and they formed this broad um, alluvial or coastal plain. Uh, this is an image of the Kuiperowitz Formation. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. It's a, this is specifically in the Blues Amphitheater area or uh, region of the Grand, es Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Um, and it's a beautiful place to do field work. The Kuiperowitz Formation is, is a really interesting uh, body of rocks to look at. It's composed predominantly of fluvial sandstones and mudstones, and it represents a really wet environment. In fact, the deposition, sediment deposition rates are some of the highest known uh, for the Western Interior Basin during the late Cretaceous. And we collected soil carbonates from numerous paleosols that can be found preserved in, in the outcrops, and paleosols being a technical term for fossilized soils. And we were interested in collecting these carbonate nodules. So I'll, I'll, I'll give just a brief overview of how we can use uh, soil carbonates as a climate proxy. Uh, one reason, reason they make such a good proxy is they're ubiquitous in the geologic record, both spatially and temporally. They come from throughout the Phanerozoic and uh, they can pre be, the, they, they form in a variety of different environments uh, all around the world. So they provide us good temporal and spatial information about climate. They form over hundreds to thousands of years in a soil profile. So they represent an average kind of a time averaged picture of climate. And they do, they are restricted to mainly arid and semi-arid environments. Um, as they grow, they feel the local environmental conditions and those conditions are recorded in their isotopic composition. So for example, this is kind of just a schematic picture of a carbonated molecule. Uh, the carbon isotopes can provide us some in and above the soil, uh, specifically uh, regarding uh, vegetation and plant communities. The oxygen isotope composition can give us information about the local hydrological cycle uh, and uh, hydrological conditions. And the specific proxy I'll be talking about today, the clumped isotopes, can give us quantitative estimates of the formation that these carbonates formed at. So they can tell us what the soil temperature was as these carbonates were forming. With clumped isotopes, we're interested in uh, counting the proportion of, of carbonate molecules in a sample that have a heavy carbon-13 bonded to a heavy oxygen-18. And you'll notice that throughout the talk, I'll use this fancy um, uh, capital Delta 47 notation to refer to our clumped isotopes. And essentially, uh, that notation is referring to the fact that when we analyze these carbonate molecules, we digest them in phosphoric acid and that produces a CO2 gas that we then analyze in the mass spectrometer. And the molecular mass of the specific uh, molecule that we're interested in measuring happens to sum to 47. So we use this, this CAP 47 terminology. Now you can notice in this graph down here in the lower right hand corner that the abundance of these clumped uh, molecules is proportional to temperature. So we have formation temperature here on the upper y-axis. And you can see that as temperature decreases, the abundance of these clumped isotopes increases. And so if we can measure that abundance in a given sample, we can then reconstruct the temperature that the, the carbonate formed at. So it provides this really great quantitative estimate of, of formation temperature. Um, and, and I'll just point out that uh, all of the interpretations that we make regarding these, these Cretaceous soil are informed by a whole slew of modern case studies. So, uh, and these case studies have been performed by dozens of different researchers and, and, and research groups around the world. Uh, one case study that I was involved in was looking at soil carbonates forming in, in the Chilean Andes. Um, and we were looking at how changes to the seasonality of precipitation affected the, the timing of carbonate formation. So just keep in mind that this, these, these paleo, uh, paleoclimate interpretations we're making are informed by modern case studies. So here's just a, a quick summary of the types of soils we find preserved in the Kuiperowitz and Two Medicine formations. Now, interestingly, in the Kuiperowitz formation, the predominant soil type are called inceptisols, which are very young, 
immature soils. They haven't had a lot of time to develop pedogenically. And this is consistent with the high sediment deposition rates that we see in the Kuiperites formation. It suggests that these soils only had a brief window of time in which to form before they were uh, covered by, by fresh fluvial sediments that were being deposited. So they, they ne were never able to form for prolonged periods of time. In contrast, in the two medicine formation, we see much more well-developed soils uh, typified tip, uh, most often by alpha sols and, uh, and aridosols, which are kind of consistent with formation in sparsely vegetated woodlands and also in, in drier environments. We collected our soil carbonate samples uh, from these different types of soils. The mean clumped isotope temperatures that we got for both of these formations was 35 degrees uh, Celsius in the Kuiperoids formation and 33 degrees in the two medicine formations. So we have our clumped isotope temperatures, but then we're left with a bit of a conundrum, which is what season do these soil carbonate temperatures actually represent? And this is a, a difficult question to, to untangle. There's a lot of different uh, processes and, 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 uh, and uh, um, factors that influence when these soils or when these uh, carbonates form in a soil. For example, uh, the timing of uh, vegetation respiration, uh, the annual cycle in soil temperature, and also in, in precipitation, and also the, the type of precipitation, all of these parameters can, can influence whether our soils are forming uh, year round or in the, the spring and, and fall and thus represent kind of a mean annual temperature or whether they're biased towards the more warmest month temperature. And, and modern studies have shown that typically soil carbonates are forming during the summer and they represent a warmest mean monthly temperature, but you can also get uh, carbonates forming at, at strange times of the year based on local soil characteristics. So we needed to verify, excuse me, which of these seasons our temperatures represented because that was going to affect our interpretations. Um, I mentioned that most carbonates tend to form during the summer uh, and that's because soil carbonates tend to form when a soil is either drying or has reached its driest point. You can imagine that in kind of a, a typical soil if our wet season occurs during the summer uh, then our driest period in the soil is going to be during the winter months and these green bars to the side supposed to represent when we would expect to see soil carbonates forming. So in an in a, in a area to, typified by a wet season, we would expect to find soil carbonate temperatures more consistent with wintertime soil temperatures. In contrast, in an area with a winter wet season, we would expect our driest uh, soil periods to be during the summer, and thus we would expect to observe higher clumped isotope temperatures consistent with those summertime um, in the modern environment, this is often fairly easy to figure out because we have a, a whole slew of data uh, about the timing of, of the wet season. We can monitor soil temperatures uh, throughout the year. Uh, but during the late Cretaceous, it's a little more difficult to figure out when that wet season was occurring. Um, luckily for our particular study area, the Western Interior Basin, this has been the focus of hundreds of papers over the year looking at its, its paleoclimate conditions, its uh, paleological characteristics. And there have actually been a lot of studies looking at the hydrological cycle, the annual hydrological cycle in the Western interior or over the Western interior seaway in the, the ad adjacent coastal plains. And there seems to be a uh, general consensus from both model and proxy studies uh, that during the late Cretaceous, uh, there was a monsoon or a monsoon-like system operating over the Western Interior Basin. And thus most of our precipitation was falling during the summer. Now, monsoon periods are, or, or monsoon precipitation regimes are a little unique in how they affect uh, the timing of soil carbon formation. Modern studies in India and Tibet have shown that even though most of your rain is occurring during the summer, you're actually only forming your carbonates directly prior to those monsoonal rains because that's when temperatures are high enough that uh, and those soils are finally able to dry out after after the heavy monsoon season. So we interpreted our soil temperatures based on this as being uh, as being consistent with a, a summertime warmest mean monthly temperature. And there's actually other good reasons to think this. 
Um, if the Kuiperowitz and two medicine uh, clumped isotope temperatures represented a mean annual temperature, then we would expect our summertime temperatures to be in excess of 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. Now in the modern, studies have shown that plants begin to die from heat effects uh, at right about at those, right around those temperatures between 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. But in the Kuiperowitz formation and the two medicine formation, we find abundance, abundant evidence of vegetation. And this suggests that the plants weren't, uh, weren't heat stressed, we weren't in a desert environment that would experience super high summer temperatures. And we take this again as evidence probably that our, our temperatures represent a man, uh, maximum annual temperature or a summertime temperature. So we have summer temperatures. How do we go about calculating mean annual range in temperature? Now, in the modern world, this is a trivial calculation. You, sim you simply take your, your kind of mean summer temperatures, subtract from them your wintertime temperatures, and that gives you the total range in temperature that, that a particular site would experience over the year. Unfortunately, during the late Cretaceous, or, or at least for our study area, we don't have good estimates of wintertime temperatures. So we're unable to make that simple calculation. Instead, what we do have are our summertime clumped isotope temperatures. And then from previous studies, we have uh, estimates of mean annual temperature from uh, leaf physiognomy methods like uh, leaf margin analysis or the CLAMP proxy. And then we also have uh, vertebrate oxygen isotope estimates of mean annual temperature. Now, if we assume that the distribution of temperatures around the mean is symmetrical at our, at our given location, then we should just be able to take the difference between the warmest mean monthly temperature and the mean annual temperature. Uh, take that difference and multiply it by two, and that should give us the entire range of temperatures. So the question is, is that a valid assumption? Are, are temperatures really symmetrically distributed uh, during the year? So to answer this question, we looked at modern temperatures, again, from the ERA Interval Climate Analysis data set. And what we found is that for most environments, um, and, and given the, the uncertainties associated with clumped isotope temperatures, for most environments at, at all latitudes, uh, temperatures really are essentially symmetrical. Sorry, let me move this. Um, the x-axis here is a measure of seasonal asymmetry. Uh, anywhere with a value of zero would mean that the summertime temperatures and wintertime temperatures are equally distant from mean annual temperature. And then as you deviate from zero, either in the positive or negative direction, you're skewing your temperatures towards uh, one season or the other. And what we find is that uh, for nearly all environments and over most latitudes, uh, an assumption of seasonal symmetry uh, holds true. Now, if you're at very high latitudes, uh, over, especially over ice sheets, or if you're, you're in subtropical deserts like the Sahara, you can you do start to get a deviation from that that seasonal symmetry. But luckily, uh, the environments we're looking at, looking at in the late Cretaceous were at mid latitude, and they don't represent these kind of extreme environments. So, based on these observations, we suspect that this this assumption is is valid. So, let's look at these these mean annual range and temperatures. Then, so uh, I'm I'm going to kind of explain what this plot is showing. Uh, start with the Kuiperowitz formation and then and then show the results for the two medicine formation as well. But we had two different estimates of mean annual temperature for the Kuiperowitz formation. Uh, the first was 21 degrees Celsius from Upchurch et al in 2015 and the second was 17 degrees Celsius, so four degrees cooler, from Wolf in 1990. And then for each of those uh, mean annual temperature estimates, we could also, uh, we also had to make an assumption about whether our soils were uh, our soil temperatures were elevated with respect to air temperatures due to soil, so, uh, soil radiant heating. Um, and you have all experienced this, this phenomenon. If you go out onto bare sand or something during a hot day in the summer, the, the, the sand surface is much, much hotter uh, than the air temperature above it and that those higher temperatures will propagate down into the soil profile. Uh, so we've made, uh, we'll, we'll calculate mean annual range and temperature, uh, first assuming there's no excess soil heating, and then uh, assuming a, a, an excess soil heating value of three degrees Celsius. These, uh, the dashed line here then represents our mean annual uh, air temperature estimate. We have one more constraint we can add in, uh, work done by Markwick in 1998 looking at uh, the relationship 
crocodilians and temperature showed that crocodiles can't survive in areas where the coldest mean monthly temperature is less than 5.5 degrees Celsius. And we find uh, uh, crown group crocodilians in both the Kuiperowitz and, and uh, two medicine formations. So based on the presence of these animals, we would expect that our wintertime temperatures likely weren't colder than 5.5 degrees. We can then add in our clumped isotope temperature shown here by these red dashed lines. And again, I'll just remind you that in the two right-hand boxes, those clumped isotope temperatures have been uh, have been lowered by three degrees to take into account the um, soil heating. And then using the difference between our mean annual temperatures and our soil soil temperatures, we can then calculate a coldest mean monthly temperature, which is shown here in blue. So these are the results for the Kuiperowitz formation. We can then uh, also do the same calculations for the two medicine formation. And we can then rule out a few of these, uh, a few of these options because we're, we're presented then with a whole range of possible uh, mean annual range of temperature values. But you'll notice that a few of these predict coldest mean monthly temperatures that fall below that crocodile. And so we, uh, we reject those as being unlikely and we're left with a, uh, a kind of our best estimate of the mean annual range in temperature for both Utah and Montana of between 21 and 27 degrees Celsius. So how does this compare to previous estimates of uh, late Cretaceous mean annual range in temperature? In this plot here, we have latitude on the x-axis and mean annual temperature on the y-axis. Uh, these different colored bands, the green, blue, and red band here with the solid lines, those show uh, modern averages of mean annual range and temperature with latitude. So the green one is for a kind of a global average. The blue one is an average for all of North America. And then the red, line, the, the red band and line are the, the average mean annual range and temperature for the specific longitude that our two study areas come from. The dashed red line are previous um, model estimates of late Cretaceous mean annual range and temperature, again, from Hunter et al, 2013. And then far down below, we have the dashed green line, which are previous proxy estimates of mean annual range and temperature. You can see that our estimates of, of temperature seasonality for the Kuiperowitz and the two medicine formations are much higher than previous proxy uh, estimates and, and much more consistent with model simulations for the late Cretaceous and with uh, uh, much more consistent with, with modern mean annual range and temperature values for similar latitudes. So what does this tell us then about the equitable, equitable climate problem? Well, first off, it tells us that soil carbonate-based estimates of late Cretaceous mean annual range and temperature are, are similar to modern mean annual range and temperature values. And this suggests that even though uh, mean annual temperatures were elevated during greenhouse periods, we, there probably wasn't a large reduction in mean annual range and temperature. So at least when it comes to seasonality, these, these greenhouse periods may not have been more equitable at all. We would have still seen large temperature swings between the summer and the winter. Uh, our model, uh, model simulations of late Creta Cretaceous temperature seasonality are also consistent with the soil carbonate-based uh, estimates. Now, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but we're doing some, some additional research into this. And we, we think that a lot of these uh, proxy and model disagreements may, may have to do with how the models are treating uh, different land cover types um, in, in their models. And, and, and we actually have a paper that we're getting ready to publish in geology that's looking at how different land cover types affect mean annual range and temperature and which proxies would be um, would be associated with those different land cover types. So hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to provide some more information about why we're getting these drastically different proxy estimates of mean annual range and temperature. And, and, and it turns out, I don't think it's because uh, some of these older proxy based estimates are wrong. It's just that they're recording seasonal, uh, seasonal temperatures from, from very different environments. So the final implication from this study is that late Cretaceous organisms likely needed to have strategies to deal with occasional cold snaps. Um, all of our reconstructed mean annual ranges and temperature predict wintertime temperatures that are, that are only slightly above freezing. And those, those represent mean monthly temperatures. So it's entirely possible that we could have had daily temperatures that did dip below freezing. 
This means that, that just like in the modern, animals would have needed strategies to cope with these uh, cooler temperatures. This is a picture of an alligator uh, dealing with freezing temperatures during the winter of 2018 here in North Carolina. And uh, when temperatures uh, do dip below freezing, these alligators will bloomate, which, which means they, like you can see here, they, they keep their nose uh, above the ice and then they kind of just enter into a hibernated state and wait for temperatures to rise. So this has interesting implications for how animals may have, have dealt with cooler temperatures. This leaves us then with a question. How did spatial climate variability affect biological communities? It looks like there wasn't a big change in mean annual range in temperature between Utah and Montana during the late Cretaceous, even though they were separated by uh, many degrees of latitude. But we do know that there were mean annual range in, or mean annual temperature differences, excuse me. How, how might these uh, spatial climate patterns have affected biological communities? So for the last part of my talk, I'm going to focus on this question and look at the interaction between biological communities and climate. This is uh, the results or, or the, the, the study that I'm going to share with you now. We actually just published in uh, GSA Bulletin. And so I'd encourage you, if you're, you're interested in, in the, the methods and the results that I share with you here, go take a look at that. Because um, it, it turned into a really interesting little study. Our study kind of began thinking about a long standing that is whether or not during the late Cretaceous vertebrate communities, specifically dinosaurs, were divided into distinct northern and southern biomes or provinces. And there are a lot of proponents for this hypothesis. There are a lot of uh, opponents of this hypothesis. I've tried to kind of demonstrate here uh, in, in a graphical form what the hypothesis is. I'm showing three different time slices here. Uh, the Campanian at 75 million years ago the early Mastrictian at around 70 million years ago and the, the late Mastrictian at 66 million years ago. And uh, uh, multiple paleontologists have suggested that there are, are species uh, in all three of these time periods that are uh, restricted either to a northern province, I've tried to show these, uh, these species in blue here, or to a southern province, and I've tried to indicate those in red. Um, now, of course, th there are the opponents to this hypothesis argue that either uh, uh, these species aren't really temporally coeval or that uh, the perceived uh, north-south uh, restrictions of these species are just due to either uh, to oversplitting of different taxa. And they'll also point out that there do appear to be some species that, that ranged uh, across the entire uh, north-south uh, length of the western interior basin. Um, proponents of this hypothesis have recognized that there's not really any evidence of a geographical barrier that would have separated these two provinces or kept animals from migrating north and south. And instead, they've suggested that there was some kind of climate barrier at about the latitude of the Colorado-Wyoming border. And one thing I noticed as I started to read into the literature was that although a lot of these papers suggested there was a climate barrier, um, they never really were specific about what that climate barrier might have been or and none of them seemed to actually test that hypothesis so my goal the, the goal of my group was to compile as much quantitative paleoclimate data as we could for this region and and uh, create spatial uh, spatial temperature maps in order to test the hypothesis of whether or not there was a client some sort of climate barrier in the western interior basin so here's a, a picture of our study area. We were looking at, at the entire Western Interior Basin from, from Northern Alberta down to uh, Northern Mexico. And we divided our data up into three different time periods or time slices. Uh, the Campanian in panel B here, the early Mastrictian, and then the late Mastrictian on the right. And what you can see, one thing that's important to note is that uh, over the course of these three time periods, the geometry of the Western Interior Seaway changes dramatically. And, and that'll have a big impact on, um, on our both on our climate patterns and on the distribution of different animal groups. We collected over 250 data points uh, on uh, with quantitative temperature reconstructions. And then we also compiled new data sets of um, fossil leaf and pollen assemblages uh, for the region. And, and our goal with those was to, to attempt to see if they're, just like with the vertebrate, uh, vertebrate assemblages, 
to see if we could find evidence of a northern and southern biomes in the paleobotanical records. So in order to create our spatial maps, we used an in, the inverse distance weighting uh, spatial interpolation method. And a lot of you are probably familiar with this. It's a fairly simple method that calculates a weighted average for a given unsampled location based on a set of nearby neighbors. And the closer a neighbor is to your unsampled site, the more it will contribute to the final value, in this case, to the temperature estimate for that unsampled location. There are two different parameters that you can toggle when doing inverse distance weighting. One is P, which is, is the power, and that's how, how quickly uh, or, or how the, the weighting, the distance weighting evolves as, as distance increases. And, and then the other one is the number of neighbors that you're going to include in the average. And for our study, we, we determined the best values for P and N uh, using a, an iterative jackknifing approach. And that allowed us to, to toggle those P and N values until we could minimize the root mean square error at any of our, our known sites. So here's the result of our spatial interpolations. Uh, again, we had three different analysis windows, the Campanian, early Maastrichtian, and late Maastrichtian. Uh, in these plots, we're showing mean annual temperature in the color bar we've got with, with the, the darkest reds representing a mean annual temperature of around 25 degrees Celsius and the darkest blues represent a much colder mean annual temperature of around 10 degrees Celsius. And what immediately jumps out at you is that there was a similar spatial pattern in temperature for all three of these time periods with a warmer uh, southern uh, temperature zone uh, in all three periods and then a cooler northern temperature zone that was on average about five to six degrees cooler than that southern temperature zone. And then in between those two zones, there was this latitudinally narrow, uh, narrow band of rapidly decreasing temperatures, which we called the temperature transition zone. And what's interesting is that the, the kind of the average latitudinal position of this uh, area of rapidly decreasing mean annual temperatures uh, was at, a, at approximately the, the latitude predicted by these previous paleontological studies for the, the putative climate barrier. Um, we can look at this, these temperature reconstructions as latitude gradients uh, as well instead of just spatially. And what you can see is that in those southern warm zones, mean annual temperature was around between 20 and 25 degrees uh, Celsius. And in the northern cool zone, temperatures dropped to 15 degrees Celsius. And we see a large, uh, approximately five to 10 degree decrease in temperatures in, in that transition zone. Uh, and then also notice that the, these temperature, these transition zones are restricted to a, fairy, a fairly narrow latitudinal range. And if you calculate the latitudinal temperature gradient within these transition zones, it actually comes out to between 1.3 to 1.6 degrees uh, per per degree latitude. And that's actually four, uh, three to four times higher or a three to four times larger gradient than global mean latitudinal gradients for the Cretaceous. And uh, this suggests that you could actually, you, you might actually expect to find significant heterogeneity in your latitudinal temperature gradients um, as you move from, from one area to another in the late Cretaceous. And uh, the, the presence of this, um, of this temperature transition zone is, is consistent with this idea that there was a climate barrier in the Western Interior Basin during the late Cretaceous. Now, we wanted to independently look at the fossil poly and fossil weak assemblage data and see if we could find their evidence of some kind of, um, of provinciality or, or a northern and southern biome as well. In this first plot I'll show you, we're looking at the fossil pollen data. And we're, we've got uh, latitude on the x-axis uh, increasing from 45 degrees to 60 degrees. And then on the, the y-axis, we're showing the standard variance difference, which is a, essentially looking at the difference in variance in the dice similarity index between northern fossil pollen assemblages and southern uh, fossil pollen assemblages. And it, and it was, uh, I'll admit, this was kind of a, a complex calculation that was carried out by um, the the paleontologist I was working on this study. But essentially, uh, we were looking at to see how this various variance difference uh, evolved over, as you moved north or south uh, across the study area. 
And we, we interpret these, these uh, deep troughs that you find in the variance difference as being evidence of, um, evidence of a, a, a change between the southern, uh, the southern biome and the northern biome. And the depth of these troughs shows how, um, how porous that barrier was. So, so a, a more shallow trough would be evidence that there was more communication between the southern biome and the northern biome. Whereas a deeper trough, like we observe here in the Campanian, means that that barrier was less porous and there was more of a stark difference between the southern and the northern biome. In contrast, the width of these, these troughs indicates the latitudinal width of that, that pollen transition zone. And so we can see that during the, the Campanian, even though that, that uh, boundary zone was, was starker and there was less communica communication across it, it was actually a latitudinally broader zone that might have functioned as kind of a mixing zone between the northern and southern provinces. In the fossil leaf data, we, we also see evidence for north-south changes. So in this plot here, uh, what we did with the leaf data was we took the, uh, the, the genera that we identified in the fossil assemblages and used a nearest living relative to, to associate those genera with different ecoregions. So for example, uh, we would assign those genera to either a coastal plain, estuarine or aquatic, open shrubland, swampy lagoonal, uh, temperate lowland, tropical lowland, upland, or uh, wetland or successional ecoregion. And we find that there's, there's uh, changes between the northern and southern biomes in the abundance of genera that are representative of these different ecoregions. So for example, in all three time periods, but especially here in the early Maastrichtian, we can see that the temperate lowland forests, uh, the genera associated with the temperate lowland forest are much more abundant in the northern cool biome than uh, genera associated with the tropical lowland forest. And the reverse is true in the southern warm, uh, the southern warm biome where the, the tropical lowland forest genera are much more abundant. Um, and so we not only see changes in the pollen, but we also see changes in the types of environments that we were finding in the southern zone and the northern zone. And one thing that's really interesting is that not only were these, these environments changing between the north and the south, but the types of plants that were most common in, say, the temperate lowland forest were different in the southern warm biome than in the northern. So there was both a change in ecoregion abundance and in the types of plants that were, were most representative of those ecoregions. So the question then becomes, we have evidence for both a, a climate barrier and, uh, and distinct northern and southern primary producer biomes, but what was driving these, these north-south changes? And we believe there was actually the unique paleogeography of the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, during the Campanian, especially when you had the, the interior seaway connecting the Arctic Ocean and the, Pale the, the Proto Gulf of Mexico, it, it would allow for warm tropical waters to be transported north into the center of the continent and colder Arctic waters to be transported south. Uh, and where those two, that, the, that warm and cold water body meet, would form a polar front. Um, and there have been a lot of proxy and modeling studies of circulation patterns in the Western Interior Seaway. And many of those studies, most of those studies, seem to suggest that this polar front uh, would have been positioned between 40 and 51 degrees north, which is, which is consistent with the position of our mean annual temperature transition zone. So we believe that the presence of this, this cold Arctic water body north of the polar front was depressing uh, mean annual temperatures on the adjacent coastal and alluvial plains. Likewise, the presence of the warm tropical water to the south of the polar front was raising temperatures on the, the adjacent coastal plains. And uh, this was then setting up the, the, the temperature pattern that we saw with this narrow mean annual temperature transition zone in between. Uh, we believe that the, uh, we interpret the, the pollen data and the leaf fossil leaf data then as being um, evidence that this, this uh, spatial pattern and mean annual temperature was then also affecting the distribution of primary producers. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, there's not a high enough resolution uh, from our vertebrate fossil assemblages to do the same kind of study and definitively say whether or not 
uh, you know, for example, dinosaurs were, were, were really were split into these northern and southern provinces. However, we believe it's reasonable to assume that if we were seeing these changes in, in vegetation from the north to the south, that would have affected uh, the, the distribution of large herbivores, for example, which in turn could have affected the distribution of, of, of carnivores preying on those animals. So what do these findings tell us about the equitable climate problem? Probably the biggest impact, the biggest results of this study is that the late Cretaceous latitudinal temperature gradients uh, could vary significantly due to re or regional paleogeography. And this is inconsistent with the idea that, that uh, latitudinal temperature gradients during these greenhouse periods were kind of uniformly, uh, uniformly shallow and, and warm. And we see that we could actually have quite a bit of variability in temperature changes. And then also, we, we, our, our study provides some of the first uh, real evidence that the, of, of interactions between spatial patterns and climate and spatial patterns in paleobiogeography and suggests that, uh, that, that the paleobiogeography of primary producers uh, was directly impacted by changes in climate. So before I end, I just kind of wanted to give a quick snapshot of, of, of kind of where my research is moving now. My goal has kind of been to shift from these these regional studies of um, of paleoclimate conditions in the Western Interior Basin and to kind of get a more global perspective. So for the past year or so, I've been collecting uh, or I've been compiling all of the quantitative and semi semi quantitative data I could find about paleoclimate during the entire span of the Cretaceous. And we're we're uh, the goal of our study now is to create. Um, climate maps for nine time slices during the Cretaceous. I'm showing here just as, as an example uh, the the paleoclimate data we've collected for the Bariacian and Valanginian, the kind of the earliest period of the Cretaceous. Um, and we're collecting temperature data, precipitation data, and then lithological indicators of climate as well. And I'm working with a statistician here at North Carolina State University to then take this data and feed it into a statistical model um, and, and create these climate zone classifications. And these are just initial results here, but I think they're really exciting. And so this is showing uh, our, our kind of our, our rough draft of mean annual precipitation in the upper map for the Bariacian Valanginian, and then uh, mean annual temperature as well in the lower plot. And one of the exciting things that we're able to do is take uh, estimates of paleo elevation and feed that into our uh, analysis as well. And so that lets us see where temperatures would decrease due to uh, elevation related lapse rates and whatnot. So this is an ongoing project, and, uh, but I think it's an exciting one and it should provide a new independent benchmark for uh, model simulations of late Cretaceous climate to be compared to. So to, to finish my talk, I'd just like to, to kind of uh, re-emphasize, I think, some of the, the important conclusions that I've kind of learned for myself while, while working in the late Cretaceous. And the first one would be that it, when reconstructing ancient climate, it's important to use multiple proxies and techniques. And I think this holds true for any geological investigation. The more tools you have, uh, the better and the more accurate interpretations you're able to make. And then number two, modern case studies are critical for understanding how climate proxies work. A lot of the uh, interpretations we're making on, for example, these soil carbonate temperatures are informed by studies of modern soils and modern soil, uh, soil carbonates. And these types of uh, modern case studies are just critical for being able to accurately understand past climate. And then finally, a, a lot of my recent work has been using geostatistical and geospatial techniques to, uh, to understand uh, these proxies that, that, that we've been using, these quantitative estimates of paleoclimate that have been produced in the past. And I think they offer a powerful tool for understanding and constraining ancient climate. And I think it's one that, that uh, uh, paleoclimatologists that work with proxies, I think this is kind of a new area for them, uh, for them to explore, is taking their, their proxy results and putting it into br a broader global or regional context using these geostatistical and geospatial methods. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you again for letting me uh, share some of this research with you. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this point. And again, if people have questions, you're welcome to throw them in the chat or just chime in.
did you use any of your um, carbonate dating on that um, in that more recent research? Any of the carbonate data is that? What yeah, 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 yeah. And so, in the more recent research where we were compiling, um, or, or we were creating these spatial maps, yeah, we were we were compiling as much data as we could find. So, so we did include those results from my previous studies. I was wondering, you talked about a land cover discrepancy. Do you have like specifics on what types of land cover are creating like biggest discrepancies? Are you talking like albedo differences or is it how the vegetation is interacting with like other atmospheric variables? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I'll, hopefully I can answer your question well. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. So for reconstructing mean annual range and temperature, there have really been two proxies that have been used more than any others. One is soil carbonates, like, like I talked about today, and the other one is the, the clamp uh, leaf physiognomy pro, uh, proxy. So this looks at the kind of the morphological characteristics of leaves, of fossil leaf assemblages in order to reconstruct climate. And the, there's, there's this big disagreement in mean annual range and temperature estimates between these two proxies. The, the clamp proxy kind of consistently predicts that, that mean annual range and temperature during the late Cretaceous, even, at, even in the high Arctic, was less than you know, 15 degrees Celsius. And then with the, uh, the soil carbonates, even at lower latitudes, we get these larger mean annual range and temperature estimates. Well, it turns out that uh, that uh, if you start to think about where these proxies are forming, soil carbonates are forming in open environments that are typically arid to semi-arid. And even just thinking about the moder modern environments and modern landscapes, those are areas that are typically associated with large swings in seasonal temperature. In contrast, uh, fossil leaf assemblages are primarily preserved in uh, low energy depositional environments that are there. So they're coming from very wet environments. Uh, they're, they're often characterized by low elevation, low slope, and they're areas where you can get these, you know, large forests growing. So those are two very different types of environments. Um, and we've been using a statistical model. So, so in the study where I'm working on right now that we're hoping to, to submit pretty soon, we, we used a statistical model called a conditional autoregressive model to look at modern uh, estimates of mean annual range and temperature for the whole globe and relate that to different land cover types. And, and what we've found is that after taking into account things like uh, elevation, latitude, distance from the coast, uh, those differences in land cover type, specifically between fossil leaf assemblages and, and soil carbonates, can explain about uh, up to 80% of the, that difference that we see in mean annual range and temperature estimates. So exactly what's causing those differences, I, I suspect probably has a lot to do, like you were saying, Maria, with uh, albedo differences between open environments and uh, vegetated environments humidity differences, precipitation differences, soils that are wet will uh, change their, their temperature changes more slowly than dry soils. So there, a lot of those uh, different parameters will feed into these, these proxy biases that we see. That makes sense. Thank you for that explanation. Sir. Can the Delta 47 approach be used for other types of carbonates other than the terrestrial soil carbonates? Yeah, definitely. The, the challenge is just like with soil carbonates where we had to do a lot of modern work to understand when the soil carbonates are forming and, and how precipitation might affect that. With each type of carbonate that you want to, ana you want to analyze, you have to do a lot of, of, of work understanding that carbonate system. But, but yes, um, People have done really good studies using, for example, um, bivalve, uh, so biogenic carbonates, bivalves and, and um, gastropods. Um, they've attempted to use coral, but it looks like there's some 
some weird kinetic isotope effects that are associated with the way coral grows. There's been a lot of work looking at speleothems. Um, oh, and then uh, bioappetite from fossilized reptile and mammal teeth has also been another another one that's been applied to. But so, long story short, yes, if you find a bit of carbonate, we can we can apply this method to it. <laughs> Well, it's looking like we're just about out of time, unfortunately. Landon, thank you so much. This is a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate it. There'd be loud applause if we <laughs> could transmit it over mics. Um, for though, if you know of anyone who's interested, and in, anyone here who's interested in hearing this presentation, we do have it recorded and we'll have it available for distribution on the back end. So feel free to contact me and I'll get you in touch with what you need. And with that in mind, thanks again, everyone, for participating. Thanks so much to Landon for putting this all together and doing this phenomenal research. We really appreciate it. Thank you all. And again, Maria, thanks for the invite. It was great to talk to you guys. Yeah, great to have you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>